This episode of the Art of Manliness podcast is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own professional website, portfolio, and online store. For a free trial and 10% off, visit squarespace.com slash manliness. That's squarespace.com slash manliness. And enter offer code MAN at checkout. That's offer code MAN, M-A-N. A better web starts with your website. Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. So we've talked about on the site that an important part of manhood or manliness across cultures, across time, is being autonomous and independent. And for modern Western men, a big part of becoming autonomous and independent uh, and freestanding is getting a hold of our finances, being on top of our finances. But if you're like most men today, you probably don't think much about your money except for checking your checking account balance every now and then. But if you really want to get ahead with financially, uh, you need to treat your personal finances much like a CFO or chief financial officer of a business would. At least that's the argument that personal finance writer J.D. Roth makes in his new ebook, Be Your Own CFO. So J.D. Roth, he's the founder of a popular personal finance website called GetRichSlowly.org. Um, and he just came out with a new ebook called Be Your Own CFO, along with an online personal finance course. And in today's podcast, JD and I talk about what it means to be CFO of our own personal finances and how switching to that sort of mentality can help us immensely with getting ahead financially. Great podcast. You're, it's crammed with just like really useful, practical takeaway tips. So I think you're really going to enjoy it. So stay tuned. J.D. Roth, welcome to the show. Thanks, Brett. Glad to be here. Let's tell. Let's talk a little about you, you for our listeners who aren't familiar with you or your work. You call yourself the accidental personal finance expert. Right. How did you accidentally become a personal finance expert? Well, uh, the bottom line is I sucked at money for a long time. Uh, I spent. I grew up in a household where my parents didn't really know how to manage money. They they were always broke. Uh, when they did have money through a windfall or whatever, they would just spend right through it. So and the, their balances in their checkbooks were always zero. Uh, I went to college. I, I developed poor personal finance habits myself. And uh, by the time I graduated, I had the uh, start of a credit card problem. And I just grew throughout the 1990s until uh, by 2004, I had over $35,000 in consumer debt, which is uh, less than some, but uh, a lot more than others. And trust me, $35,000 in consumer debt... Uh, feels it feels like you're chained you're enslaved to your debtor or your creditors so uh spurred by some friends i started reading everything i could about personal finance and then trying to put some of this stuff into practice and as i did this i started writing about what i was doing uh, for the web i started a blog called getrichslowly.org and uh, i documented the things i was reading about uh, the things I was trying, what worked, what didn't, the mistakes I made, the successes I had. And for whatever reason, Get Rich Slowly uh, built an audience and rather quickly. So I started the blog on April 15th, 2006. And within a couple of years, I built that uh, audience so that I had 100,000 subscribers and was making a, a lot of money from the website, which uh, naturally helped me get out of debt quicker than I thought I would. Eventually, I was able to quit my day job. It was awesome. Yeah. Well, I was one of your first readers. Like, from yeah, the that's right. yeah, that's how we, we, we met. And then you inspired me to start my first blog, The Frugal Law Student. Frugal Law Student. I remember it. It was awesome. <laughs> Those were the days. Yeah. And I think the reason why it grew so quickly is because like, people resonated with your story. There's a lot of people who were in the same boat. Mm -hmm. And there at the time, like, there's all these, like, yeah, there's all those personal finance books and things like that. But it, like... It was always written by experts who probably never like had to deal with being having thirty five thousand dollars in consumer debt or right. overcoming that. And you provided like a narrative, like, "Hey, look, this is what I'm doing. It works. Um, I'm an average guy. I was a screw up with my money, but now I'm not so much of a screw up anymore." Right. I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Brett. I think that a lot of uh, personal finance books, at least say a decade or more ago, were written by people. 
uh, who were on Wall Street or they were accountants or certified financial planners, people who had their act together. And yes, the information they were providing was correct, but it didn't take into account a lot of real world stuff. It didn't take into account psychology and emotions and relationships and all these things that make personal finance messy. Because uh, as I think most people realize, uh, smart money management is more about mindset than it is about math. It, it's about uh, mastering your emotions and mastering psychology and uh, uh, learning how to uh, do things uh, in complex relationships where you're, you're dealing with your friends and your family. And so uh, I think uh, not just me, but a lot of personal finance bloggers that were getting started in the mid-2000s uh, they were telling their personal stories, and you're right, this, this resonated with people. And also at the time, uh, behavioral finance, the field of behavioral finance was beginning to uh, take off. And that actually is a field where people uh, write about what people, how people handle money in their real life instead of in ideal ways. Very good. Um, so you started to get rich slowly, and yeah, you're, you, said it, you, you were able to quit your day job. This helped you earn a... A, a very lucrative income. You're able to pay off right. your consumer debt, and basically, you went from JD the screw up to JD like I got my finance financial act together. Um, and so now you you come out with this new guide called "Be Your Own CFO," right? Right. Right. Um, and I, I think it's interesting because it's such a it's such a great idea and a great concept because you talk about in the the guide or ebook that. You know, when you were, when you worked at your day job, right? You you took care of your business finances like meticulously. Like you took mm -hmm. care of that because you didn't want to get audited by the IRS. But then your personal finances were a wreck. And I think a lot of people are like that. Like they'll be very meticulous if they own a business, like with their business finances. But like to their personal money, they just they just don't care. Why do you think people are like that? How can why do you think people could be so meticulous when it comes to business but not personal finance? You know, I don't actually know the reason. I think maybe people are forced to be meticulous with their uh, business finances uh, because of the IRS and uh, because if they aren't meticulous, the business can't survive. I think we all understand that in order to survive, a business has to make a profit. Now, profit is not necessarily the purpose of business. Some people would argue that it is, uh, but I I've seen plenty of research that indicates uh, profit is a byproduct of, of other uh, objectives, of doing other objectives well. And the great example is Apple Computer, which uh, they're very explicit. Steve Jobs was very vocal about the fact that their purpose was not to make a profit. Their purpose was to make great products. And if they were able to do that, then the profit would come. And so uh, profit is kind of like food and water for a business is the way I look at it. We, we need food and water for our bodies. We don't live to eat. That, that's not our purpose, right? But we need the food and water in order to survive. And that, that's the same thing with a business. So I think people grasp that, that a, a business needs a profit in order to continue being a business. Otherwise, it goes out of business. But what people don't realize is the same idea applies to your personal finances. If you have an objective, if you have a mission, if you have things you want to get done, in order to accomplish those things, you have to have a profit. That's the only way you're going to reach your objective. And most people, for example, have an objective of retiring. And in order to be able to retire, and retirement is the same thing as financial independence. They're essentially the same thing. In order to achieve these goals, you have to have a certain amount of money that can support you for the rest of your life, however long your life will be, or however long you think your life will be. So you've got to earn a profit until you've accumulated enough money to sustain that goal. Interesting. So, I mean, how did you come across? I mean, so when did it click for you when you were like, hey, I can do what I do with my business finances to my personal finance? I mean, how did that, that connection happen for you? Well, it was kind of a gradual thing. I mean, it, when I finally decided to get out of debt and take control of my personal finances in 2004, it, it, it occurred to me that if I use some of these same skills that I had used to make my business successful, then perhaps uh, I wondered, you know, what, what would happen if I used them in my personal life? And so I began applying them. And the more I applied them, the more successful I was. And at first, I mean, it, it was a conscious thing. I was making a conscious decision. And it's kind of funny. Uh, I don't want to go too much into this because it's a deep rabbit hole. But part of this was based on I had uh, set up a sort of business. We'll put business in quotes in the game World of Warcraft where I bought and sold. 
I would buy things cheap at the auction and then resell them uh, at higher prices. I was basically doing arbitrage. And uh, that too serves as an inspiration, this fake business. I was like, you know, why am I not trying to do some of this stuff in real life? Why am I doing it in a computer game where it doesn't matter at all? Why not try to do some of this stuff in real life? So just over time, the more I put these principles into practice, the better results I had. And so when it came time uh, to write this particular guide, this guide is part of Chris Gillibo's Unconventional Guide series. I, I don't know whether your listeners are f- uh, familiar with Chris, but he writes a blog called The Art of Nonconformity, and he founded a convention here in uh, Portland, Oregon called the World Domination Summit. He also has a series of uh, online guides called The Unconventional Guides, and they're like The Unconventional Guide to Art and Money for Artists Who Want to Make a Profit, or The Unconventional Guide to Travel Hacking, and, and so on. So he said, J.D., why don't you write me a guide, an unconventional guide to money? Uh, when he asked me to do that, I, I kicked around a lot of different ideas. I had three false starts, as I told you before we started recording. And it was only once I latched onto the idea, I, I thought, you know, I remember when I, I was trying to get out of debt and I did that whole business thing. What, what would happen if I like carried that metaphor even further? And so uh, I started writing the guide as Be Your Own CFO. And uh, it just clicked and it made so much sense. I loved the way the metaphor worked. And every time uh, I would then bring this metaphor to the people I was talking to about personal finance, my friends and my family who were asking me questions. And when I would explain it to them, it it was like this light bulb went on in their head. They're like, oh, I get it. Try to aim for profit. And so anyway, that's the long version of how this thing is developed. Let's take a quick break for a word from our sponsor. All right, so this episode is brought to you by Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one platform that makes it fast and easy to create your own website. I wish I had something like this when I was starting The Art of Manliness because it took me, I just, it was so frustrating. I had, you had to know HTML, you had to know CSS, you had to know PHP. So I was tinkering with it and I would just break things. And so I ended up, ended up having to hire a professional web designer anyways, costing me a lot of money. Uh, with Squarespace, there's none of that. You don't have to know that. HTML or computer coding. It's just click and point and click and drag. And in a few minutes, you can have a fantastic looking website that works across multiple devices, laptop, smartphones, tablets. Uh, You get 24 seven support with Squarespace. So if you've been thinking about starting a website of some sort, an online store to uh, sell your wares, uh, check out squarespace.com. If you want a free trial and for 10% off, Visit squarespace.com slash manliness. That's squarespace.com slash manliness and enter in offer code man, M A N, at checkout. And now back to the show. So, okay, let's get talking about like, some of the things you talk about in the ebook because it's, it's really good. I mean, it's just very practical, but also uh, relatable at the same time. Um, and so you start off talking about the, the first thing you need to do is come up with a mission statement. Which for a lot of people, they'd be like, well, why is this doing in a personal finance book? <laughs> like, what is, what does my, my mission statement have to do with anything? What does that have to do with personal finances? Like having your, I guess you kind of touched on that before with like the Apple example, right? Right. Well, you know, I think that uh, I would venture to say that most people uh, don't really have particular direction in their lives. They're very reactive. And I, I don't mean this uh, in a, I'm not trying to condemn people for doing this because nobody tells us, oh, you need to have direction. So people just kind of uh, move aimlessly through life, reacting to things and maybe planning a little bit ahead. Uh, But as a result, because they don't have a destination in mind, they just kind of wander. On the other hand, the people who do decide that they have a goal, uh, whether that goal is to travel the world, to retire early, uh, to buy a house, to send their children to college, whatever those goals are, uh, they help provide focus and direction to whatever it is you're doing. So if you have a particular goal, and I, in, uh, in the guide I call it a, a mission statement, and I talk about how you can develop a mission statement and then sub-goals that go along to support it. If you develop this mission, it can keep you focused so that it's much easier to make cho- choices with your money. If your goal is for example, for example, one of my goals is to travel across the United States next year. I want to leave here, leave Portland, uh, buy a used travel trailer, and travel across the United States for six months, uh, interviewing people as I go. That goal keeps me focused. I know that I need to save money to purchase a used travel trailer and to uh, support my 
um, travels as I'm not, no longer writing about money. I, I'm going to have to live off my savings, and I, I don't want to have to tap my retirement savings. So this goal keeps me focused, and it, it means when a friend calls me and says, hey, uh, J.D., do you want to go out for dinner tonight? Uh, I'm more likely to su suggest something like, well, why don't you come over here? Uh, I'll grill up some hamburgers. It'll be cheaper, and then we can go for a walk uh, because I know that that's going to save me money, keep me fit, and uh, it's going to be more aligned with what my personal goals are than going out to dinner and sitting around drinking and not doing anything. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know for me, um, a few years ago when my wife and I were like in debt pay down mode, like it was just like pay off our debt. That was our goal. Right. And then like we just, every decision we made financially, was just like, what can we do to pay this debt off as fast as we can? Mm -hmm. And it really helps. Cause like, you know, we were eating like what Dave Ramsey says, like beans and rice, like <laughs> spaghetti and like nachos, like every day, you know, cause it was cheap, but it paid yeah, off. Yeah. And every once in a while you'll realize, or you'll make a decision uh, and say, you, you know, uh, right now I do want to go out to dinner with my friend. Uh, the example I'm thinking of is right now uh, my girlfriend and I have, have both managed to put on a little bit of weight over the past uh, year or two. And so we're uh, we're in fitness mode. We're trying to do what we can to eat right and, and so on. And, and that means we're consuming a lot less alcohol. And so our default is because we know we want to lose weight, we are not drinking alcohol and we're especially not drinking beer. On the other hand, last night it was a beautiful, beautiful sunny day here in Portland and uh, we went out to dinner with some friends and we still know that our goal is to lose weight. We made this conscious choice. We decided intentionally we are going to drink. And so uh, she had a glass of wine and a, a cocktail and I had a beer and a glass of wine. And so uh, it's not that you have to deprive yourself but when you have a mission – it's much easier to make decisions and uh, be conscious about how you're spending money. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's great stuff. So you have a section I thought was really great about like financial reports, right? So every business has these different financial reports that they produce out on a qu quarterly and yearly basis. Mm -hmm. um, you suggest some financial reports or metrics that you should keep track of in your personal finances. Is there one in particular that you think is like the most important that people need to start thinking about more and yeah. they might not be doing it right now? Yeah, I think... The most important personal finance metric is what I call profit margin. And most people would know this as saving rate. And your saving rate is basically uh, the percentage of your income that you're setting aside for future use, whether that's in savings accounts or retirement accounts or investment accounts or whatever. And in general, we are told by financial experts that you should set aside 10% uh, of your income. And the uh, really ambitious financial experts will say 20% of your income. So they're suggesting a 10% saving rate or profit margin or, or as much as 20%. And you know that, that's what I recommended for a long time too. In my first book, Your Money, the Missing Manual, uh, I'm all over the 20% thing. But after talking a lot uh, in the past year or two with people who have achieved financial independence at a young age, people who've uh, uh, basically retired early, and by that I mean at 35 or 40 or 50, uh, especially uh, a fellow named uh, Pete who writes a blog called MrMoneyMustache.com. It's the he, coolest blog name. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. He, he's got passionate followers because of, of his advice. And the advice is, yeah, this 10%, 20% saving rate or profit margin, that's great. But if you follow that advice, you're going to be working at your job for 45 years because that's how long it takes to save enough to retire. On the other hand, if you bump that savings rate up to 30%, uh, you can retire much quicker. That's my ex-wife. She's saved 30% of her income. She's going to retire at age 50. But Pete says, you know, if you bump it up to 50%, you can retire by 40. Or if you're really, really industrious and bump that savings rate or profit margin up to 70%, you can retire in about 10 years. You can, you'll have accumulated enough money to uh, live off uh, at your current spending rate for uh, the rest of your life if you keep your spending rate there. Um, and at first I kind of blew that off as like extreme thinking is it, and it wasn't really possible. But looking at the math, no, he is absolutely right. If a young person coming out of college, man or woman, says, all right, I'm going to just do this. I'm going to buckle down and save 70% of my income no matter what. In 10 years, they can retire and fund their uh, spending level. And the, the amazing thing about that is when you retire, uh, I, I think a lot of people think of retirement as just l lounging around playing golf, that kind of thing. 
But from what I've seen of the people who do achieve early retirement through this sort of extreme saving, uh, they, they continue to make money. It's like me now. I've accumulated enough money. I'm 45 years old. I've accumulated enough money that I could retire if I wanted to. But I continue to do other things like this Be Your Own CFO guide, which is part of the Get Rich Slowly um, year-long course, by the way. And that produces income for me. And it's just kind of a sidelight. I don't need the income, but it's I'm doing something that I enjoy and I think provides value. And even though I'm retired, I'm continuing to generate income. So bottom line, and I'm very talkative today, aren't I? No, it's giving fine. you these long it's great. answers. I love it. The bottom line is the most important metric a person can look at in their personal financial life, I think, is what their profit margin is. And if your profit margin is small, say 5%, do what you can to get it up to 10 or 20%. But if it's already at 10 or 20%, see what you can do to bump it to 30 or 50%. So that may mean cutting back on expenses or trying to find ways to make more money. Yes, exactly. So my philosophy is uh, the best way to do this isn't through like clipping coupons, although there's nothing wrong with clipping coupons, or uh, uh, other things that produce tiny uh, benefits. But you want to see what you can do to produce uh, big changes to your financial situation at once. And this is much easier to do if you're just starting out, if, you're, if you've just graduated from college. If you can refrain from adopting the adult lifestyle when you graduate from college, get an adult income but don't have adult spending levels, uh, you're going to be so much better off. But if you already have an adult lifestyle, there are a few changes you can make that uh, produce big results. Uh, unfortunately, people are very, very resistant to these changes because they go against uh, the way our culture operates, what we tend to value. The, the big changes that I try to stress are, uh, number one is housing. Cut back on your housing costs. Uh, the typical American household spends a third of its uh, budget on housing. And this is enormous. And it's much larger than it used to be in the past. And I feel like if people would cut their housing costs back to, say, 20% or even 15% of their budget, they could save huge, huge amounts of money. The second source that people can cut back is transportation. And most people actually could cut back on transportation today if they just made the resolution, okay, I'm going to find other ways to get around than drive my car. And again, transportation is the second largest uh, piece of most American households' budgets. It's, it, it, if people could find alternate routes or alter, alternate means of getting around, like taking the bus or biking, or uh, I've got a motorcycle, which is much cheaper than driving a car, um, these things, this cut would uh, provide a huge impact to the bottom line. And then the, the third big change that people can make is boosting their income. And this could come through negotiating a pay raise, uh, taking a second job, selling things, uh, wh whatever it is. Generating additional income is another great way uh, to boost your profit margin. All right. So focus on those big wins. Exactly right. Big wins. All right. Um, so you have a section about budgets, right? So if you're going to run a business, businesses have budgets. So if you're going to be the CEO, CFO of your life, you need to have a budget too. But the thing is, lately you've been you see a lot of talk in the personal finance sphere that budgets don't work, right? Like, mm -hmm. sort of like how diets don't work. You know, you need to make lifestyle changes instead of trying to go on a diet. You want a lifestyle change. Um, how do you respond to that that argument that yeah, budgets don't work? So just kind of focus on general lifestyle changes in your finances. Well, I, I think that there is merit to the argument that the lifestyle changes are most important because that's true. However, to say budgets don't work is misguided. Uh, some budgets don't work. And the reason they don't work is they can be very fussy. They get overly complicated. They try to track too much detail. So uh, I'm a huge advocate of um, what you might call budget frameworks, which are broader budgets that might have, for example, just three categories. Uh, I've been a longtime advocate of a budget framework or a budget, if you prefer, called the balanced money formula, which was suggested by Elizabeth Warren and Amelia Tiagi in their book, All Your Worth. But anyway, the, the balanced money formula suggests that uh, you just have three budget categories. Uh, the first category is needs. And your goal is to get your spending on needs to be below 50% of your take-home pay. So that means uh, needs include things like your uh, basic housing, basic clothes, basic food, and so on. You want those to be below 50% of your take-home pay. And you also want to save more than 20% of your income. 
Now, again, remember I said earlier that ideally you'd be saving 50% or more of your income because that's going to get you to your goals much quicker. But this is a good start, 20% or more of your income. And then that should leave you roughly 30% to spend on wants. And uh, Warren and Tiagi say that this balanced money formula is a way to provide peace of mind um, and you're able to uh, have everything you want and everything you need while saving for the future. And I think it's... Uh, by limiting it to just three categories, it makes it a lot less fussy and it's something that people can follow. And yeah, yeah, I agree. So my experience with budgeting has been like, yeah, you start a budget and then you're always just tinkering with it. Yeah. Like you spend all your energy, like trying to like tinker with it and like set everything out. Like every dollar has to have a place. And then like, it just saps so much mental energy that like you don't have the willpower to actually follow it anymore. Yeah. For me, a budget is kind of like a roadmap, you yeah. know, to take you in the direction you want to go. And I don't necessarily need a, a roadmap that shows me every little twist and turn. That, that's good, just going to drive me nuts. Uh, what I want instead is just a, a, a general map that says, yeah, stay on the freeway until you hit San Diego and then take this exit. I, I don't need to know about all the other exits or uh, how many lanes are in the freeway at this point and so on. Um, so, yeah, I, I think a, a broader budget framework is, is best for most people. Definitely. Okay. So you kind of hit on this a little bit, you know, a lot of our listeners are in their twenties, uh, maybe early thirties, mm -hmm. um, just starting out in life. Any specific advice you have for them? Uh, you mentioned like, don't have adult lifestyle, right? Don't, don't, don't pay for that inflated lifestyle, but anything else they can do to like, that'll just have a huge payoff, um, years down the road for them. Uh, well, you know, Brett, I would go back and uh, point to this uh, having a mission statement and having goals because I think that uh, being clear on what your purpose is and what's important to you, knowing what's important to you can keep you uh, focused when your friends are doing things that uh, might not be in your best interest. If I were to pay attention to how my friends spend money, I would buy a lot of cigars and a lot of booze. And I'm not saying that I don't drink and that I don't smoke cigars, but uh, – I let them do whatever the hell they're going to do because they're following their priorities. I pay attention to my priorities, and it took me a long time to get to there. When you're young, it's very easy to be taken with the notion that you need to have the sorts of things that your friends have or, or that your parents had when you're growing up. But if you can resist the urge uh, to compare yourself to others, to uh, uh, be seduced by the notion that you have to have what other people have or, or what the people on TV have, that's even worse, you're going to get so much further ahead than anybody else, I I any of your other peers, as far as your personal finances are concerned. And the key is becoming clear on what is important to you so that you're able to make these choices wisely. Yeah, that, I think that's nails the, I mean, that's awesome because like I, I've noticed that there's a lot of, there's a tendency for young people to be like, I just want to keep my options open. So like, like coming up with a mission statement, like a purpose, it seems sort of constraining. And what they don't yeah. realize is like that it can change. Like you're not stuck in it for the rest of your life, right? Like right. You can change this as your life progresses, but it, you need to have something like at least one thing you're focusing on that will give you some sort of direction in your life. So you don't go off to someplace you don't want to be. Yeah, and I think it's important to realize that there are opportunity costs associated with everything that we uh, spend, and whether it's time or money. Uh, when we choose to do one thing or choose to spend money on one thing, we are basically saying, okay, I'm choosing not to spend it on something else. And so if you go out and you buy a new car for, say, $25,000, you're choosing not to spend that $25,000 or $30,000 after financing – on something else, whether that something else is travel around the world or uh, retirement or a new house or whatever. And it, it may not be a conscious choice. You may not be consciously saying, oh, I would rather have this car than to travel around the world for a year. But it is effectively the decision that you're making. And so you need to realize that these opportunity costs exist and uh, – they really have a huge impact on your future. I was really dumb with money when I was in my 20s, Brad. I got into huge, huge credit card debt, and I made choices that once I got down the road 10 years later, I was like, what in the world was I thinking? I basically mortgaged my future uh, for the sake of, of a few like luxury items uh, when I was younger. Yeah. Well, that that's I think that's solid advice. I mean, it's something we try to hit on the site a lot for uh, young guys is like, 
have a mission, have a purpose, yeah, something, right? All right, well, JD, um, last question. Um, we'll wrap things up. So yeah. tell us a bit about, about this guide. So it, it's this, you know, be your own CFO, but it's a part of a, a course as well. Yeah. So th- this was kind of fun for me. Um, I'd never done anything like this. I, I thought it was just going to be like a, a standard PDF ebook that people could download. But Chris Gillibo was like, no, 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 let's make this part of a bigger project. So we created the Be Your Own CFO Guide. And it, it's about 120 pages. It contains all the, it's like the distillation of everything that I've learned reading and writing about personal finance over the past 10 years. And it's got all my, uh, uh, all my latest ideas because I'm constantly evolving. I'm constantly learning new things about personal finance. And it, so it's got all the latest information that I've been able to, uh, accumulate. And Chris said, well, let's add some more stuff and make it into a course. So we, we basically have a 52 week email series where every, uh, every week we send out a new email about a personal finance topic. Some of the stuff is about how to handle psychology, how to handle relationships, but it's also some practical stuff too, like, um, how to set up an estate plan, which sounds boring, but everybody needs to do. And, uh, then I also, uh, you, you do this podcast, but I'm kind of new to this kind of thing. Uh, and I decided it would be fun to interview uh, some of my friends in the personal finance world because I have a lot of contacts. So I interviewed 18 different people, uh, and uh, those interviews are available as part of the course. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff, like a guide on how to negotiate your salary, a guide to setting up a Roth IRA, which is a, a basic retirement account that everybody should have. And it, it's a, it, it went from being just an ebook to this large comprehensive course. And I'm really proud of it. I feel like it's the best work I've ever done. That's awesome. Where can people find out more information about it? We set up a website at moneytoolbox.com. Money people can go there and learn more. Awesome. Well, JD Roth, it, it's been a great conversation. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I've thank been a big you. fan of your work since way back when. So uh, thanks so much for taking the time That's to talk to me. Thank you. Our guest today was J.D. Roth. J.D. is the founder of GetRichSlowly.org, and he continues to write there today. And he just released his new ebook slash online money course called Be Your Own CFO. And you can find that at MoneyToolbox.com. Uh, you can sign up for it there. Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at ArtOfManliness.com. And also, Father Days is coming up. Check out our store, store store.artofmanliness.com. We've got some new cool coffee mugs. Really manly and hefty and cool looking. I'm really, I think they're cool. So check them out, uh, store.artofmanliness.com. And until next time, stay manly.